When I was 18, I really didn't have any clear sense of what I should do uh, beyond graduating from high school. When did you start to write poetry? Oh, when I was 15. Well, 15, 16. Teenage it's, stuff, or yeah. I'm really interested in playing with this form? Well, no, it was, it was more teenage stuff. So here's, you were talking, asking about song earlier. So here's the thing, and the connection between song and poetry. And I do think that song evolves first out of the chanting and the whistling and uh, shrieking and screaming and so on as one is running from the saber, saber-toothed tigers uh, and all the rest of it. But, but uh, uh, and then later you have more organized uh, forms of, of song. I mean, song is essentially verse. We still talk about verses in song uh, and so on. And of course, uh, the art song, bel canto, poetry is often involved in, in art song as well. Um, and and uh, uh, so when I'm 15, I'm just graduated from junior high school, and and where I was a, a pretty popular guy, uh, and so on. End of grade nine, I'm going to go into grade 10. It's uh, Queen Elizabeth High School. It's, it's a, I'm I'm now going to be a small fish in a big pond. What am I going to do to distinguish myself? Uh, there's going to be a whole lot of other smart kids there, and smarter than me for crying out loud. Um, where I was one of the smartest kids in my junior high school. I knew going into high school was going to be a whole different situation. So what am I going to do to distinguish myself, demarcate myself? Um, I knew it wasn't going to be sports. I was into track and field, which was absolutely not glamorous. And I was doing distance. I wasn't even sprinting. I was doing distance. Mile, two mile, half mile, 1,500 meters, 800 meters, that kind of thing. There's no glamour in that. Nobody's interested in you if you're, if you're, if you're a distance runner. Ah. You know, so... So I couldn't get on the basketball team, couldn't get on the football team, uh, wasn't going to be on the hockey team, uh, and, and, and I couldn't sing, and I couldn't play any instruments. So what was there left for me to do as a teen? Well, write songs. That was the message that came to me, write songs. So the day that I finished junior high school, the day I graduated and got my little diploma and my little certificate, I went home, broke out a scribbler, a whole bunch of colored markers. Uh, and started writing poems, uh, sorry, songs, four songs a day. And I was very much influenced in, in, in those days by none other than Bernie Topin, the uh, lyricist for Elton John. And I said, like, I gotta write like, I gotta write like Bernie Topin. Then I started to read all these books about songwriting, and they all said the same thing. All the books I took out from the North Branch Library about how to be a songwriter, they all said, you gotta write like Bob Dylan. You gotta write like Leonard Cohen. You gotta write like Joni Mitchell. You gotta write like Neil Young. You gotta write like, like Lennon and McCartney. And then I started reading books about the blues and and uh, and blues lyrics, which are very concrete, very sharp, and very witty, and so on. And I thought, okay, okay, this is this is you now I'm understanding that this is the kind of song I should be trying to write. But these books were also saying uh, over and over again, the best songwriters are really poets. So I thought, okay, if I'm gonna be a good songwriter, I've gotta be a poet. So then I started reading poetry uh, in order to become a better songwriter and then to write poems. So I went from writing four songs every day to writing four poems every day. And whose poetry were you were reading? Like the like classics, the Byrons, the Shelleys, or the Bob Dylans and the E.E. E. Cummings? Dylan, Cummings, uh, but then also, uh, uh, of course, Ginsburg, uh, the Beats in general, because they seem cool. And they seemed down to earth, and it was relevant, and so on. But even more relevant for me were uh, the black poets, black American poets of the 1960s, but then also the negritude movement poets of the 1930s, 1940s. Uh, and and uh, uh, so um, uh, everybody from Leroy Jones or uh, Mary Baraka uh, to Carolyn M. Rogers, Amy Césaire, Leopold Sator Sangor, uh, African poets, uh, you know, poets who were who were uh, uh, against um, against misery, against exploitation, uh, socially minded poets. Garcia Lorca, for crying out loud, a major uh, 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 voice for me because of that whole his whole attitude towards accepting folklore and the peasantry and so on is the source for for his great art. Um, and so I I read widely. I read a whole lot. I didn't tend to touch on the canonical poets, the British poets, not much. It was it was basically American 
uh, some Canadian, because by the time uh, I started to dabble in, in poetry and song, the Canadian nationalist movement, which had basically started around 65, mm -hmm. uh, with the publication of George Grant's Lament for a Nation, uh, was starting to peter out, it was starting to decline, but there was still a vestige of that. Um, I remember as a 10-year-old writing a, a letter to an American um, uh, a pen pal complaining about America because I had been so influenced by Grant as a 10-year-old. As a 10-year-old. The guy never wrote back. Kid from California. And I was chosen out of all the kids in, in the Halifax school system. I was the one who was chosen to answer this uh, fellow 10-year-old's letter from somewhere in California. And no one, no one edited my letter. No one checked my letter, which is, of course, appropriate. No one should have. But I remember sitting down and writing this, this anti-American letter. <laughs> and sending it off with a, what, a five-cent stamp back in those days? Five-cent, six-cent stamp?